Hello everyone, it's been a while, but we're back with another discussion video. In this video, we'll be looking at uh, where we think the future of exploitation will go and what it might look like, uh, particularly when it comes to memory corruption style issues and, and where that falls. We'll start with the professional space. I think when we get to the future of the professional space, there will be a shift away from memory corruption um, in the attacker space. Um, I think, Z, you probably share my view on that. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd say we're already entering that shift, um, and that shift started a while ago. Application security in general is a growing field. And application security, you know, dealing with the vulnerabilities that exist in, like, the application level, as opposed to pen testing, which deals with more the network level. We're seeing the shift. A lot more, com a lot more software companies are hiring people to look at the software they're developing to find these vulnerabilities in it. And they're writing it in languages that don't have these memory corruption issues or don't have those memory corruption issues easily hittable. Oh, I mean, the runtimes may still have it, but it, at a professional level, there's a demand for AppSec, which overlaps with the binary and memory corruption type issues. The demand is, is I think, going to be looking for a lot of these higher level issues. And I think as time goes on, just doing this sort of exploitation gets more difficult as more software is being written that isn't vulnerable in these ways. The demand's going to go down and the demand is already reasonably low. Like if you've got the skill to do it, it's there, but the demand's kind of low and I think that's going to continue. It is going to be harder to have a, to have a real career in just the binary level exploitation. And in fairness, I think even now, most people who have a career, you know, do do have the skills of more generalized AppSec, or it's fairly rare to only be able to do the low-level memory corruption stuff. Yeah, if you look at, like, today, for example, in comparison to, I'd, I'd say 2014 was probably, like, the peak of where a lot of memory corruption was being seen. Um, yeah, I, I mean, go the, the... much further back than 2014. I think 2014, it's already more general app stack. I mean, by the time we get more web applications and stuff out, so by the mid 2000s, binary is already dying. And I think binary was dying as we kind of hit that 2010 period and so on. Like there were definitely some career options, but I'd go further back to saying a peak for binary level being much closer to like the year 2000. Okay, that's interesting. I, I, I'm a little bit like shifted further back. Maybe that's just because I'm newer, I guess, maybe. Um, but I think 2014, around that time, like 2012, 2014, was when we really started to see uh, the trend of mitigations really popping up. I mean, yes, there was step and and uh, and like ASLR and stuff like that for a while. It's it's in the, the, the 2010s when we started seeing, like, let's look at iOS, for example. I like using like browsers and, and iOS and kernels for like a, a gauge. And the amount of mitigations that start getting introduced with, um, like at the hardware level, starts to become like pretty insane in that decade. See, so, but I would actually kind of point out that there was kind of new life brought into the memory corruption vulnerabilities because of the mobile developments, because we started seeing more devices running there that you know were or did have kind of a hittable attack surface. You know, think about that period, you know, before we really had the phones, it's, you know, your desktop. It's still kind of your classic desktop target, less user base on a whole. And there was an explosion because mobile phones kind of came out. But I, that, I think that actually point. drove demand quite a bit for some of the binary level stuff because there was this new. Well, you can argue about whether or not it's really new, but there was this new avenue or area that really relied upon binary and low level memory corruption issues whereas before that in a professional sense it was just like the usual desktop stuff so like yes it got more difficult there i'd agree there's definitely been a shift as mobile phones have matured they've also started implementing some of the lessons we've learned off of the desktop and server realm is you know having better update process having more of those mitigations like that has definitely come with mobile phones and made things more difficult but i think there was also growth in demand yeah, I mean, th that's an interesting point that uh, I think is, is definitely worth a shout. I, I agree with you when it comes to the future aspect of, of there being a downward trend and those types of issues being exploited. I And I think the main, like the big catalyst for that, by the way, will be memory tagging. Um, I've kind of said it on our podcast before, but memory tagging is the next big scary thing, I think. I don't think it will die entirely, especially not in spaces like the IoT space. But I, I think we will continue to see that decline and, and maybe accelerated decline. Uh, when those mitigations land. 
So there was kind of a hump with Adept and ASLR too, where there was that increased difficulty of exploitation, which did kind of result in that feeling that binary stuff was kind of a dead art. And that that's, I think, why the mobile thing stands out to me so much is because that brought new life into it, a new focus center, kind of gave it a reason. And I don't know what the future will bring. Going from, assuming nothing changes though, like nothing else kind of comes up that breathes new life into it. I do agree with you. I think, you know, it is just going to get increasingly difficult. Um, and that is going to drive just the professional demand. One, I mean, as I've already mentioned there, people are writing code in safer languages. So you've got that aspect of it. As we continue to see that happen, the demand for binary level is dropping. And I mean, one way you can profit off of it right now is by profiting off of that fallen research in order to sell to the government. In the future, is that still going to be the case? Is it going to be worth it for a government to spend, you know, say 10 times more than what they're already spending to get access to, you know, somebody's phone or something like that? It might cross that threshold where the it's not worth it anymore. I agree that yeah, it's where, possible. Like, more human intelligence options become more worthwhile. Like if you put that same amount of money into trying to do a human intelligence operation, what information could they get that way? And that might be more practical. I don't know what their their risk analysis looks like for that and making that sort of decision, but it does feel like, you know, th there is probably some threshold where even at the government level, it's going to be kind of spending too much. I don't think we're going to hit that in like the next couple of years or something. But when we talk like 10 or 20 years down the road, I think it's possible that, that even professional demand, even at that level, might die out. And of course, if it's died out at that level, it's also dying out at like any more generalized application security jobs. You kind of mentioned the the research aspect, so I, I think we can we can jump to that. Right now, research is a pretty like hot topic. We cover a fair bit of interesting research on the podcast, both on the attacking and defensive side. Where it gets interesting is Will that continue to be the case into the future as things get harder? Because I, I think research will actually become even more relevant as some of those mitigations land. Maybe not so much when you're talking about like the shift to the safer languages, but I think trying to break those newer mitigations will kind of instill that interest in the research where you might think the research would die off due to like memory corruption potentially dying off. But I, th I think it might have like the opposite effect. So yes and no. I mean, research, somebody needs to find you to spend the time. To, like, when we're talking about at least university research, as is a lot of what we cover on the podcast, are they going to fund you to look into dealing with that mitigation? Or are they going to fund you to look into some higher level or lower level, like hardware level attacks? I feel like there's a good chance that research will slow down. It, it, not that it'll stop. I think research will always be there and will always actually be an option. Because if you do manage to get a break, especially at that point, if it's become more difficult, you know, it's going to be a career maker. So like, it's always going to be there, but I think it will slow down. I don't think we'll see a growth in it. I think we'll see growth in other kind of related areas. I applying fuzzing to more types of applications would be a really obvious thing though. I mean, we're already seeing growth and just fuzzing research in general. We'll start seeing more of like the hardware level attacks. I mean, we already see a good chunk of them. As memory corruption starts to die out a little bit, or if it does, I do think the hardware is kind of the next Wild West. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we've already kind of seen more popularity when it comes to the like hardware and those lower level like CPU level issue attacks. Part of that is spurred on by just the speculative execution stuff like that kind of blew open the floodgates, I guess, on those types of issues. But yeah, and I mean, um, we see glitching attacks and stuff, though, quite a bit, too as we're seeing more hardware system on a chip or just like the early boot chips for security there trusted platforms all of that as we're seeing that like they are becoming a juicier target to hit also and because we're all kind of carrying around a little computer with us hardware attacks are a little bit more practical than when it was just like desktop and mainframes <laughs> yeah so memory corruption at the moment is not too crazy like if you're in the iot space it's it's actually like pretty easy but when you're getting into like let's say mobile and desktop and stuff like that you do have a stack of mitigations to deal with like you do have dep and aslr and and pi and all the stuff that's been around for a while um, yeah, and the I mean, rise of got, like cfi yeah you've got like a ton of little mitigations like windows has just a ton of little things too we're starting to see the rise of just exploit mitigations in general 
Uh, sorry, I mean like third-party services offering exploit mitigations. Like I want to say like Bitdefender, I think they sell a product that's specifically just exploit mitigations meant to, you know, make ROPing more difficult or make Joff more difficult. Um, so you've got a ton of just little mitigations that maybe aren't the strongest, but they are there. But I think in the future, when we start seeing more of the CFI, like better CFI and more support for it, when we start seeing memory tagging, things of that nature, I think when you start adding it all up, it's going to become a lot more difficult. Part of the reason that we're seeing these mitigations starting to come into play is because the performance overhead of some of these mitigations at one point was super high. But as computers have gotten better and the, midi the work on the mitigations has gotten better, those overheads have been reduced to such a negligible level that we're starting to see them land on, on the hardware level or at the software level if, if it's not at the hardware level yet. On, on the hardware level, it's we're seeing the actual impact of these mitigations is they do work. And developers, quite frankly, just can't be trusted to write secure code. And that's not to fault developers. It's just it's hard to remember every single security issue for every single line of code you write. So you want to handle issues centrally. And thus is why we're seeing more mitigations being brought out as it's a centralized handling. Even if you write the bad code, the issue itself is kind of handled. Um, and yeah, I, I agree, like, it's going to get more difficult, especially CFI is one of the big things that is going to drive the difficulty of exploitation, I think, to require yet another bug, if even that, if it is even bypassable in some cases, it is going to kill out some classes of bugs. I, I guess I'd relay a little bit, ASLR and DAP came in, they killed out some classes of bugs, some really simple exploits, and so now you kind of need your ASLR bypass, and you need to do some, you need a new technique for dealing with death. And chaining those two is is kind of difficult. It's going to be the same thing, I think, with CFI. I do have faith that, like, we're going to have ways around it. There will probably become some new generalized technique. Or just a shift a shift to uh, data-oriented attacks. Yeah. That's, that's probably where it's going to go. Which I guess is kind of just a different technique, too. It's going to get a lot more difficult, though. I, I think we both agree on that point. It's just the layers keep adding up and adding up and adding up to the point where... There's a pretty, sub like, even now, there's a reasonably substantial level that you need to reach to actually have, like, a full chain exploit. Like, you're gone from the days where you just have a stack overflow, and you're good to go. Heck, I mean, in most cases, just this plain old stack overflow now isn't even exploitable, because you need something to deal with ASLR. If, you, if you've only got that linear overflow on the stack, you might have IP control or PC control, but you don't have ASLR defeat yet. Yeah, and, and on that point of there being so many layers that you have to deal with, I think we should probably touch on the learning aspect too. Breaking into exploit development is already a bit of a challenge. You're playing a lot of catch up. A lot of the beginner resources for exploit dev are focusing on stuff that was being done back in like the early 2000s, uh, pre ASLR, pre DAP. Already, you have to play a lot of catch up if you want to get into modern exploitation. As things continue, I don't think the resources will be able to keep up because in all honesty, like there are some awesome resources for exploit dev, but there's not a lot of new resources. There's a ton of resources that cover stuff from like the 90s and early 2000s. But when you get to, let's say, CFI, for example, there are like not a lot of resources out there that even talk about CFI. And that's partially because it's not super popular yet. But like if those resources can't keep up, then breaking into exploit dev is, is going to become almost like a pipe dream to get up to like a modern level. I do think there's a chance that the resources that matter will catch up. So by that, what I mean is you kind of run into this issue, I think, with any sort of expertise. The beginning, the fundamentals, everybody kind of knows what those are. It's really well defined what those fundamentals are. So there are a lot of resources available to you. And then once you get past those fundamentals, there are so many more options for what you can go and learn that just the resources become more dispersed. I mean, do you go and learn about... You're saying about CFI, do you go focus on some other mitigation? You go learn about heap allocators and getting an exploit because you've got control of a free or something, or the size of an allocation or whatever. Once you have that foundation, you can branch off into all these different areas. So like, that's a problem in general, I think, with anything that requires expertise. But once that foundation is known, so like now I'd say you've got some reasonable resource to even learn raw, which you just didn't even have, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have a lot of those same resources. But now that raw has really become that fundamental thing that you need to know, there are resources. So I do think at the fundamental level, things will keep up. There will be resources once it's kind of established what you need to know. But there is going to be that period, I think, where we just don't know what, what it's going to be or what it's going to look like or what you really need to know. 
I think overall bridging the gap is going to be more difficult because the gap is going to get wider before it can be filled. Oh, for sure. I mean, as I'm saying that, I do think resources will fill in part of the gap. I agree that it's just adding on. It's just more and more to learn. You know, in years past, you know, you can just go with smashing the stack for fun and profit and I have a pretty good setup. You can get started. Now you've got to go from there. You've got to learn... Well, now you've got to deal more with the heap. You've got like use after phrase, um, type confusions. You've got these other class of vulnerabilities that aren't just linear overwrites. Um, obviously, you've got the different techniques, the ropping, jopping, uh, co-op attack if you want to deal with CFI. Um, you, you've got those options. So, I mean, yeah, learning is going to get more difficult. I don't know if I want to say like there's going to reach a point where you really need like a university exploit or sorry, university degree or something. I think that's going to take quite a while before we really reach that point or if it ever reaches that point. But I, I think we're going to see almost like an exponential increase in the time that it takes, though. As I think more exponential is a good are. word to use there. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been kind of vague in terms of saying like, it'll be a while before it reaches the point of no return or whatever, but that's because we honestly don't know. But if we try to have a little bit of fun and try to put a rough time window on when we think exploit dev will no longer be accessible or no longer viable for pulling off attacks anymore would you be comfortable giving a rough year estimate like how many years, years that might be i, I want to say 20 20 years i wouldn't bet a long career in pure binary exploitation right now like i wouldn't just get into just that now i'd want to say yeah about maybe 20 years is kind of what i'd see it could be sooner but i just want to leave the door open for there could be a shift that just blows everything right back open again that makes it more approachable and we all just kind of keep hacking. Like, I mean, that's what's happened in the past. So if we use Pat the past as uh, to predict the future, which you can argue about whether or not you should, that would say it's just going to keep going. I do think there's going to continue to be vulnerabilities, just it's going to shift out of the binary level. Yeah, I mean... When I think about just memory corruption on its own in isolation, I think there's probably like five to 10 years left. That might be pessimistic. That might be lower than what people are expecting, but I think that's probably reasonable. I, I think, think memory pegging is a few years out um, IOT, and more mitigations like that. IoT and like SCADA and all of that, they have such a long life that it's still going to be around for some of that, though. That's a fair point like, to raise. With yeah. a significant amount of usage. Um, and there's always kind of some lower level stuff that gets you. So I, I think five to 10 years is a bit short. I mean, we're not even talking about seeing uh, on our recent podcast, we're talking about seeing like CFI in you know, a couple years on Android in the kernel. Possibly. Uh, I mean, it's possible that timetable gets sped up, but. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. But like that, that's only the mobile phone. How long is that going to take to trickle out to desktop? Now, are we going to have the year of the uh, year of the ARM desktop? <laughs> um, that's another discussion entirely, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of my point, though, is there's going to be a long tail. I kind of think we're in that long tail already. All right. That's a good way of putting it. But yeah, like Z said, I mean, we are being a little bit doom and gloom on, on the you know future of exploitation side of things. Obviously, though, we, we don't know. It, it could go the complete opposite way. I have that a really said, bad though, track record with my predictions, just to put that out there. So you're not a gambler, I take <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's definitely still some time left, and uh, that like the exploitation is still uh, really awesome to look at. We love covering uh, binary level issues. I mean, that's what I'd like to specialize in. So yeah, it's just being cautiously being cautious about what the future looks like, I guess. That being said, I think we'll probably wrap up the discussion here. Thanks to everyone who watched. Leave a comment on any of your thoughts that you might have on, on the future of exploitation in the comment section below. We have mentioned the podcast a few times. Uh, for those who don't know, we do run a podcast on Mondays, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, uh, where we talk about like recent news topics and exploits. So if that sounds like something that would be interesting to you, uh, feel free to check that out. Otherwise, we will see you guys in the next discussion video.